set you free, then you are free indeed. He also said, if you will profess me before men, I will profess you before my Father. We're going to sing the song, I am free. I'd like to see a show of hands. If you're free today, if you're free from sin, if Jesus has come into your heart, let me see your hand. All around this building, everybody in this building, if you're free, raise your hand. When we sing today, I am free, one time, but I am free. I'm free to live for you. But you died for me. But I'm free. Through the blind will see. Through the dead will rise. Through the hearts will praise. Through the earth will burn. Through the darkness flee. here guys I am free are you free today
sent in his letter to the church in Corinth that what we think we know, what freedom is, but that the only true freedom is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. We're free today, amen? I am free. freedom wasn't free our Lord paid a great price so that we can enjoy that freedom and so this morning just think about how God pursues us he loves us and he wants us with him he wants us to have a close and abiding relationship with him let's sing about how he was reaching for us through every storm that we've ever encountered he was there we may not have realized it but he was there and he loves us you sing with me you were reaching through the storm walking on the water even when I could not see in the middle of it all when I thought you were a thousand miles away not for a moment did you
was reading uh, a book last night uh, by Nicole Nordeman, and she began speaking of the thief that was crucified next to Jesus. Do you remember him? He's the one that said to, to, to Jesus, you know, remember me. And Jesus said, I tell you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And Nicole's point um, in her writing is to say that this man, this thief, this deplorable person who none of us would probably even want to befriend, Jesus did befriend him. In the darkest moment of his life, he could depend on Jesus. And she, she said, it's no accident that the very person who had no chance of earning his way into heaven is the very person that probably walked hand in hand with Jesus into this uh, gates into heaven. Just to make a point to us that there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. There's nothing that we can do. We just have to come before the Lord and accept that forgiveness and accept that salvation and accept that lifeline that He has out for us. And that is amazing love. Do you agree with me? That's amazing love. And we're going to sing this song today um, about how we're forgiven. But we're not forgiven for free. We're forgiven because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Will you join me as we sing?
nosotros te damos gracias, Padre, porque tú, Dios mío, nos has conseguido esta mañana. Well, I have an idea. Let's talk about fishing this morning. Now, we don't get to do a whole lot of that out in West Texas, but in uh, East Texas and in the South, we, uh, we were always surrounded by water and had an opportunity to do a, a great deal of fishing. That was a metaphor for the Christian life that, that I, I resonated with. When I became a, a believer and follower of Christ at the age of, of 21, there were two things that really appealed to me as I started reading my Bible. I resonated with the Apostle Paul because he talked about athletics. When he would talk about fighting the good fight and running the race, I could relate to that. I understood that wonderful analogy of the life of faith being like athletics. The second metaphor that I really appreciated was the one of being a fisherman. From the very onset of the life of discipleship, Jesus made it very clear to those disciples that if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. That's what I'm going to make you into, fishers of men. It goes along and coincides with the mission that has been given to us as, as the church, the commissioning that our Lord gave to, to his people, to us, that's been handed down through the generations to go out into the world and, and to make disciples. And so the real challenge for the church has been for these 2,000 years, how do we continue to be the presence of Christ? Well, in our text this morning, John chapter 21, and I invite you to open your Bibles there, Jesus refers in this epilogue uh, to, two, to two symbols when talking about the duty and responsibilities of the church. The first one has to do with fish, and the second one has to do with sheep. And he uses both of these to talk about what is to be our work as the church. We're to be like fishermen that are out in the world. It's by having the mindset of a fisherman that, that you and I continue the presence of the post-ascension Lord. We have this account here, which is a post-resurrection account, a pre-ascension account before our, our Lord ascends into heaven. And his teaching has to do with how you're going to perpetuate my presence in the world. And you're going to do this by being fishermen. Fishing and catching is the question this morning. There's been an unsettling statistic from various outlets, but from 2007 to 2012, the fastest growing demographic, population demographic in this country is those who express no religious preference at all. What was 15% of the population, the adult population in 2007 has grown to 20% in 2012. So that demographic of adults that say they have no religious preference has grown 33% in five years. And it seems that it's going to continue growing in its climb, especially in this day and time in the culture in which we live. I don't think I have to tell you this morning that this is not your grandmother's world and your grandmother's church any longer. We can lament and wish that it, that it was. There was a day in time, for good or bad, that, that the church had iconic status in culture and society. You had schools, government, and churches that, that were really propped up by the culture. They were accepted. They were acceptable, iconic structures within our our culture and society today that is no longer the case you and I live in a day and time that is in fact post church and post denominational we live in a day and time where the church does not have institutional presence we live in a day and time where institutions are not trusted and so it's presented a great deal of challenge. We like to think in Lubbock, I hear people mistakenly say, well, you know, we're the buckle of the Bible belt. Well, we're not, a, we're not holding the britches up very good because less than 6% of Lubbock's population is in church right now. Less than 6% of Lubbock's population is in church 
right now. Not a very good buckle, are we? That's really a misnomer in this day and time, living in the Bible Belt. The world has become so secular. The culture in which we live has become so secular that no longer do we wake up in a world where people are thinking about going to church. You are a part of a minority. I don't know how much debating you had to go through to get to church this morning, whether you were going to go to church or, or not, if that was an issue or if it was just a given that, that you were going to go to church. If it's just part of the rhythm and the routine of your life. But the fact that you are here sitting in church this morning makes you a part of a very unique and distinctive minority in our culture today. It presents some new challenges for, for the church because most clergy today were trained in, in seminaries that were staffed by faculty that really hadn't pastored or ministered since, since the 1960s. And so when many clergy graduated, they were prepared for a 1950s world only to, to discover that it's no longer a 1950s world. And so for the church, we've had to rethink, how do we intentionally reach the next generation? How do we perform well this task of fishing and catching that has been entrusted to us? How do we, how do we fish out in the culture today? How do we present the bait in a way that, that makes the Christian faith appealing and something that people would want in their lives today? Well, that's why I appreciate this, this particular passage of, of Scripture because several of the things that, that, that emerge from this story are things that will help you and I in just our day-to-day -day routine. If I recognize that the call of Christ has made me a fisher of men and how am I supposed to do that, there's some helpful counsel that's to be found in these words. The first thing is, is that fishing and catching... As you look in the first three verses of John chapter 21, fishing and catching is the weekday ministry of our lives. Fishing and catching is the weekday ministry or activity of our lives. One of our battlegrounds that we have today is that many in the life of the church still see Sunday, still see the institutional church what we do here on Sunday is the place where evangelism is to take place this is not the place of evangelism this is the base of evangelism it's here that the saints gather that the people of God gather in community to be inspired to be motivated to be coached up if you will to go out into the world where being fisher of men is the weekday activity of our lives now, you remember last week in our previous verses, we saw that the Lord had a pattern. John was very intentional in highlighting the pattern of our Lord of appearing to these disciples together on Sunday. The lesson that great things happen on Sunday. You don't want to miss on Sunday. The Lord appeared on that, that resurrection Sunday, that first Easter Sunday. He appeared to the disciples again on the following Sunday. But now the Lord appears during the week. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Underscore that word. It may be revealed or it may be, it's in my Bible, the New American Standard, it's the word manifested. It's a reoccurring word some three times in these 14 verses. That word manifest, manifested or revealed appears. After these things, Jesus manifested himself. It has to do with the doctrine of revelation, how God has revealed himself. Throughout history, God has been in the process of revealing himself and making himself known. That's what's called revelation. So now he has manifested himself again to the, to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias and manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus. Now, Thomas was absent last week. Glad to see him back this week. Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat that night and they caught nothing. Some have speculated they caught nothing because it was an inappropriate time to go fishing. They said that the context of this is that they've just been commissioned by the Lord. He's just given them the teaching that, that you have the power of the Spirit. The Spirit of the living God is, is upon you. And this is the purpose of the Spirit dwelling in you so that you will go out and win others. Now, you might think, well, that's what they ought to be doing. They ought not be fishing at a time like this. Karma is bad news. 
They got what they deserve, catching no fish at all. But what I see is that the Lord is working in the most routine and mundane of everyday activities. You can fish for men even while going fishing. Even in your recreational life. I think John is being just as intentional as he was showing the Lord appearing on Sunday among the gathering of the saints, the gathering of the disciples. I think he is saying that even in the most mundane things of everyday life, you have the opportunity to be the presence of Christ. You see, church family, we have to move away from this idea that missions is something done by someone else somewhere else. Missions will not be fully accomplished until we, each and every professing believer, every professing follower of Christ, until we embrace this notion that I'm a missionary, until we embrace this missional lifestyle that says wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, I represent the presence of Christ. It seems like we're always waiting. I know it seems more spiritual to be praying about something big God has in store for you. Oh, it's, it seems so spiritual to say, oh God, oh God, you know I want to do something big for you. God, don't, God, open my eyes. I don't want to be blind. God, open my eyes. Let me see what you have out there on the horizon for me. Lord, you know my heart. Lord, I want to do something big for your kingdom. You know what, in reality, that has more to do with ego than anything else. Praying that kind of prayer. To somehow think that, that what the Lord would have you to do, if it's going to be in keeping with your talent and your time, it has to be something of such magnitude. And we're always seemingly looking out there on the horizon, always praying about something out there that is, that is so big that God would surely be impressed to the tragic result that we miss the daily things that happen right here in life, in the classroom, at the workplace, wherever we are, those little bitty mundane opportunities to be the presence of Christ in someone's life. It's about recognizing your surroundings, having your eyes open, being sensitive, seeing every opportunity as a divine important appointment, recognizing that there is never a time when you are not the presence of Christ in this world. But there's something else we need to recognize when it comes to fishing and catching, and that is that fishing and catching is sometimes best in the worst of conditions. Fishing, especially being fishers of men, sometimes it is best in the worst of conditions. Now we see in, in verse 3 here that they caught nothing. Some would say, well, that was a failure as a fishing trip because they caught nothing. No, no fisherman likes to catch, I mean, to confess that they caught nothing. Well, sometimes fishing is best in the worst of conditions. I lived in, in Hemp Hill, Texas on Toledo Bend Reservoir for five years, my first pastorate. And, and uh, other places I had fished growing up, we didn't have striped bass, but, but striped bass were prolific in, in Toledo Bend Reservoir. And one of the things I, I learned and discovered is that, is that you could catch striped bass best in the worst conditions. I mean, when it was thundering outside, when it was downpour, torrential downpour, white capping lake, that was the best time to catch striped bass in the worst of conditions. Do you know when we're out there in the world being fishers of men, when that is our mindset that I'm the presence of Christ, I'm a fisher, I've been taught to be a fisher of men. Sometimes when we have, when we have the most influence is when the fish around us, when the people around us find themselves in the worst of circumstances. When things have so shaken their world and the foundation of, of their life and, and the kingdom that they had built for themselves, when that world is shaken, are there not those providential times when God just brings someone into their life, crosses their path, when their world has been shaken in such a way that they are all the more sensitive 
to the presence of Christ in their life through you and your life and your ministry in the way that we would come up beside them and minister in their life to cast our bread, to cast our bread out upon the waters. You think about your own pilgrimage in your life, times of spiritual growth in your life. You know, the disciples here, they, they weren't in Bible study. They, they weren't at a prayer meeting. They were on a fishing trip when they learned some very valuable spiritual lessons. My most valuable life lessons in regard to my relationship with the Lord, I wish they could say, because I've given my adult life to Bible study, I wish I could say it was in a Bible study. I wish I could say, man, I look back there in that time, boy, I'll tell you, that marker right there in my life was that prayer meeting I attended in 1983. That was, I've never been to a prayer meeting like that, no. The five or six markers that I look back to in my life from age 21 to age 53, what I consider to be considerate markers of growth, I think most of times in my life of hardship and difficulty of failure, in my own life or when I had the opportunity to walk with others through those periods in their life. Sometimes the best of fishing is in the worst of conditions. Fishing and catching is also strategically approached. There's a strategy to, to fishing. If you, if you grew up fishing or if you're a fisherman today, you know, you don't, <clears throat> you don't just go out there and <clears throat> tie a lure on and just throw it out in the middle of the lake. Fishing bass tournaments and things like that, you know, you go out to that, you go out to that given lake where the tournament's gonna be and you scout it out. I mean, you go up into the little coves and you go into little nooks and crannies, find out where the creeks are and where the water's coming in and there, there's a strategy. And not that, not that we in being witnesses, not that we strategically think in the terms of manipulating, but, but we become intentional. It's a very intentional approach that as I go out into the world, as I live my life each day, I understand this is my calling. And so I want to be sensitive to what's going on around me. I want to have my eyes open for opportunities so that I can respond strategically. Well, Jesus teaches that here in this, this passage of, of Scripture. And the first thing he teaches us about, about being fishers of men is the necessity of engagement. The necessity of engagement. Notice how he does it with these disciples as, as they're coming in. So Jesus said to them in verse 5, So Jesus said to them, Children, you don't have any fish, do you? They said no. What he's asking is how are you doing? He's engaging them. He's, he's meeting them where they are. We see it time and time again in the Gospels. Jesus meeting people where, where they are. The woman at the well. Oh, I see you're here to get water. Let me tell you about living water. He was thinking strategically. How can I, how can I take this practical situation? And how can I steer it to a conversation about their relationship with the Lord? You know, whenever I, I'm on campus, I'm on campus every day. And the question I, I most often ask on campus with students is, is not how are you doing? I ask the question, how's your life? How's your life? Especially in dealing with student athletes, I'll, I'll ask the question, how's your life? Some of them are here, they'll, they'll tell you my question always is, how's your life? Hey man, how's your life? And what I want them to hear, hear them say, what I, what I want them to hear me saying and what I hope they're translating, and really what I am saying, is how is your life the way you're living it? How is your life the way you're living it? How is your life getting along the way that you've arranged it, the way that you have ordered it? Some of these guys are very, very open. They're very transparent. They've known me well enough through the years. They're, they're very open. They hide nothing from me. And that some are very open, some are very transparent, some are more veiled, more, more secretive and don't want to talk about those things. But some are very open, transparent, man, I'm really struggling in this, in this area. Which brings, it, which brings you to another strategic response after engagement is then you offer counsel. 
You see, Jesus does, does the same thing here in, in verse 6. How does he respond when they said, no, we didn't catch any fish? Jesus said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find a catch. Cast the net on the starboard side and you'll catch a fish. You know, sometimes when, when, we're, when we're in the middle of our circumstances, when life is overwhelming us, Sometimes what we need is a counselor. We just need somebody from the outside. Sometimes the circumstances of life, the failures of life, whatever we're facing in life, sometimes it can be so overwhelming. We can be so encircled by this blackness and darkness that we can't see beyond the end of our nose. It creates a scenario where we can't see the forest from the trees. Life can be that overwhelming. And so what we need is someone who comes alongside us that will engage us in conversation and will offer us some counsel because they can see things from a whole different perspective from what we can see them. Jesus says, I have an idea for you. Cast your net on the other side. And I've lived life long enough and had enough life experience in my own and in, 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 in pastoring and being an under shepherd of, of congregations that I'm able to, to come alongside and say, well, this, this is what I'm seeing. Let me, let me offer you an idea. Let me offer you a, a suggestion. It's part of the strategic process of fishing and, and catching. But there's a third part of this, this strategy, and I think this may well be the most important, and that's acknowledgement. You see, when you're out there in the world fishing for people for the cause of, of Christ, when you're trying to, to draw them in to the kingdom of God, to, to affirm them that God has a plan and a purpose for their life, listen, the world expects judgment from us. That's the stereotype that the world has of the church and the American church. What we're known for is our judgmental spirit. That's how they stereotype us. The world is not surprised by our judging spirits. What surprises them is when they receive grace. Jesus used this opportunity to acknowledge. Listen to what he says in verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring me some of the fish which you have now caught. Bring me some of the fish that you've caught. I need what you have. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are able to do what no one else can do. You have something I need. For the kingdom of God to fully become what I envision it becoming, I need you. I need your gifts. I need your talents. I've given to you a gift set that is of vital importance in the life of the church. Everything that I envision the kingdom of God accomplishing in being, it cannot be done apart from you. You bring me some of the fish that you've caught. See, Jesus wasn't holding himself up over, over his disciples. Well, when you're, as, when you're as righteous as I am, then you can come be a part. Because the fact of the matter is, while Jesus said here in verse 10, bring some of the fish which you have now caught, he's really giving them, them undue credit. Frankly, when they were doing it on their own, they didn't catch anything. These are, I mean, literally, this is the fish Jesus caught. What Jesus is doing is getting down here. And he's affirming to us, to them, and to us today that yes, I want to work in this world. I want my presence to be a reality in this world, but I cannot do it apart from you. I've chosen to do it through you. I've chosen for my post ascension present to be a reality in who you are. And a part of, of being fisher of men is to go out and not to demean, not to judge, not to belittle, not to hold ourselves up as some sort of pompous, self-righteous individuals who have arrived. But to engage a culture in conversation that says, listen, man, I'm just a struggler. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But we sure would like to have you at the table with us which is a fourth part of Jesus' strategy, and that's the offering of friendship. Jesus says in verse 12, come and have breakfast. 
to those seven disciples. Come and, come and have breakfast. You know, if I'd, if I'd been one of those seven, I would, I would have been looking around when he said, come and have breakfast. And I, for me? Yeah, yeah, you, you. Come on, have, have breakfast. You mean me that, me that denied you? Me, the one that, the one that, that ran away in the cover of, of darkness? Me, you want me to come? Yeah, I, I want you. I want you to come to the, to the table. See, I want to have fellowship with you. I want to have a personal relationship with you. I mean, who do you, who do you have breakfast with but the most intimate people, but the people with whom you have the most intimate of relationships? I want to have a personal relationship. Yes, I know about your betrayal. Yes, I know about, about how you denied me. I know how you ran off when I needed you the most. But Jesus doesn't wag his finger in their face denouncing all those things they did wrong. He says, I want to have a relationship with you. Come have breakfast. Let's go forward in this. It's not about what you did. It's not about what you are because I know that as you and I abide with one another, I know that as you and I live in relationship with one another, we're going to move far beyond what you are right now. It's about what you're becoming. You're a work in progress. And you and I live in a world that expects us to be judgmental. And we live in a world that is amazed. Listen. As you go into work each day, as you go to school each day, we live in a world that is amazed to hear that God has a place for them at the table. Because they think they're unworthy. They think their life doesn't measure up. When in reality, their life isn't worthy and their life doesn't measure up, but neither does yours and neither does mine. And any kind of pretending that it is is just pretense. And that's why grace, abundant grace, has to be the prevailing message of the church. This whole idea of fishing and catching, let me tell you what is the most redeeming and the most freeing. What is most freeing and redeeming is that fishing and catching is a Christocentric focus. Fishing and catch, catching must be Christocentric in focus. That is, it's about Christ, it's not about us. You see, that's what the disciples allude to here in, in verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Everything that transpires is going to be a resounding theme. It is the Lord. Scriptures tell us to acknowledge him in all things as we are out in the world. As I'm, as I'm thinking strategically, I want the world to know that I give credit to the Lord for everything that I am, everything that I, I, I possess, everything that I am as a person. It is the Lord. Sometimes I do it well, sometimes I do it poorly, but it is the Lord. It's Christocentric. It's very, it's very freeing. When I came into the church as a college student, 21, I, I remember hearing sermons on, on witnessing or evangelism. And I, and I remember walking away from those being very, feeling very guilty, very guilt-laden sermons. And I, I was led to believe that, that it was about me. It was about me knowing a can to formula. It was about me having to do this, that, that everything rested upon me. And it was, very, it was very freeing when I came to realize that as I just live in obedience, as I live my life for him, as I have opportunity to engage in conversation, that anything that transpires in this person's life is what the Lord is doing. It's not about me. It's not about me uh, being slick with words. It's not about being eloquent. It's not about some kind of marketing scheme. That's not what's going to, to carry us as a church. Sometimes we'll have people say after an invitation, oh, we, we hope, hope that didn't bother you. Oh, we hate that nobody came. Hope you don't get discouraged because nobody came down during the invitation. Listen, that's never driven me. That's never floated my boat. 
You know what the question is? I ask myself after every sermon, I come down off this pulpit every Sunday, every Sunday, and the haunting question that is always in my mind is did I do the text justice? Was I faithful to the text or did I corrupt the text? And if I can answer, yes, I was faithful to the text, I've done my job. The wellness of my job, the performance of my job is not determined by the people who come down this aisle after any given message. You see, there's something that's at work here. I have to be faithful to the text. I have to do my part. The Holy Spirit has to do his part in the minds and the heart of the person who hears the gospel, who hears the message who hears of the possibilities of what God can do in your life, what he longs to do in your life. But there's a third part, and it's your response. You see, the eloquence of my words or my lack of eloquence or or your, your, your hearing and your perceptiveness to the moving of the Spirit, there's a third part here, and that's you. You're the one who has to hear the message. You're the one who has to deal with the convicting work of the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. And only you can determine how you'll respond. I do my part, the Spirit his part, and you your part. It's a very Christocentric work. And it's very freeing and very redeeming. But there's one final thing in this whole endeavor of fishing and and catching. It's a product of obedience. It's a product of of obedience. There in in verse 6, he said, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. Again, Matthew, he said, I will make you follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Just do what I said. Fishing and catching will take care of itself. Something about the word of Jesus, something about the person of Jesus that evoked in them a sense of confidence and assurance. If we do what he says, these things will will come to pass. Now, there's some some people, it's true of you, there's some people in, in your life that you ascribe great confidence in. And to those individuals, when they tell you to to do something, you ought to do this, you'll do it based upon the person of who they are, your confidence in them. And then there's others who tell you you ought to do that and because you know who they are and the type of person they are, that doesn't count for a hill of beans, what they say. And you're not likely to give yourself to their counsel, but there's something about the power of Jesus' words in his person that when we act obediently, these things come to pass. And so I think it begs the question this morning in closing, How's your bait? How's your bait? I mean, if you're you're a fisherman, you know what I'm talking about. You need to check your bait. I remember as a kid being taught when I was just learning how to fish. You know, people around me would be catching fish. I wouldn't be catching the first thing that they said to me. You need to check your bait. And I'd pull up my, my, my pole or I'd reel it in. Sure enough, there's just an empty hook or or my worm or my cricket would be half eaten. Have to replace my bait. I ask you this morning, how's your bait? How's your presentation of your faith? How are you presenting your faith? By, by the presentation of your faith, presentation is everything in, in fishing. How do, you, how do you present your bait? How's the bait being presented to the fish? How are you presenting your bait? When you're out there in, in the waters of life, how, how are you presenting your faith? I'm not talking about just orally. I'm, I'm talking about how, uh, what do people see? Your attitude, your, your behavior. How, how is your faith being seen? How is your faith being interpreted by others? How does your bait smell? Smell is important in fishing. I mean, we have stink baits when it comes to catfishing. You know, the stinkier the better. You know, they have, they have sprays now that you spray on, on your lure to give it just, just the right scent. How does your bait smell? 
you know, smell, fragrance, a fragrance, aroma is a, is a common metaphor in, in scripture, a pleasing, a pleasing fragrance and aroma to the Lord. How's your bait? Because it's by the bait that you present that will determine how well we fish and catch. Let's pray together. Our Father, you've given to us a mission. You've given to us the task of being, of being your continuing presence in the world today. By the way that we live, the way that we conduct ourselves, the way that we would speak, the way that we would engage our culture, we are selling something. We are presenting something. And we long to present ourselves in a way that, that is pleasing, in a way that is attractive, in a way that is alluring that others might be drawn to you. Father, how grateful we are that your gospel of grace is one that welcomes all people from all places to the table, to the table of fellowship. And Father, as we come to this time of invitation, if there is one that has never embraced Jesus as Lord, Master, and Savior, if there's one here that has never, for lack of a better term, taken the bait. I pray, Lord, that today might be their day of salvation. When they would receive Jesus as Lord, Master, and Savior, that others, Lord, would come saying, I want to be a part of a church that's on a fishing excursion. I want to be a part of a church that is intentional and is strategic in being fishers of men. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.